at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is not what I rehearsed last night. <laughs> now the man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to bed from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him up by his right hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate, called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, thanks to you. All right, Jesus, if you would uh, speak mightily, powerfully, uh, and as, as they uh, were filled with wonder and amazement, may we be filled with wonder and amazement at, uh, at you this morning. May we be in awe of you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I love it you here in happy faces. Um, as we begin this morning, um, we are wanting to re-invite you uh, back onto this train that's called the Book of Acts. And our goal and purpose this morning as we study the Book of Acts is to remind ourselves that we are church. That's the kind of the title for this series, that we are the church. So the church is not a building, it's not the professionals, it's a living, breathing organism uh, that is made up of you and me and all of us here. And so the book of Acts is this great book that shows that the church is on the move, that it's moving outwards, that it is always pressing and moving outwards. So it's the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so that's where we're going. That's where we are going as a church. We're going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. We know that it actually happened because we're here today. Because we are the ends of the earth. That the gospel actually reached us here today. And so, awesome. Celebrate that. <laughs> um, but if you're just joining us here for the first time, let me treat this like a Netflix special and, and give you a quick refresher of where we've been. Uh, so Jesus is walking with his disciples after his resurrection. He gives them his last words. He gets taken up into heaven. Everyone starts speaking different languages. Peter preaches his first sermon, and then there's this picture of what true community is, and then today, Peter and John are now walking into Jerusalem, as they're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He's walking into that uh, temple in Jerusalem, and to give you a frame for this whole passage here, so to give you some parameters of where we're going, I'm going to give you these three points, and I think this whole passage um, in most sermons can be summarized in these same three points, creation, fall, redemption. Okay, you may have heard of it before. So creation, fall, redemption. Uh, and that is, again, that's really just the story of the Bible. Uh, it's pretty much any sermon, but we'll use that as our backdrop for today. Uh, and so in creation, Peter and John are walking into the temple, and there's this beggar who's lame from birth. And, and when it says lame, it doesn't mean completely paralyzed. It just means, uh, it means maybe damage to his feet or to his ankles or to his hips. And so he, he could not use the bottom half. Uh, and so he is asking Peter and John for alms, or money, uh, and Peter stops and bends down and says, look at me, which is kind of weird, right? Like if I'm in this room right here and I said, all right, look at me, look at me, I want your attention, give it to me right here, focus, it's okay. <laughs> but if we're sitting one-on-one -on -one and getting coffee, I'm like, all right, look at me right here. Is this awkward? <laughs> right? I think so. This is, it can be a little awkward when you're saying, look at me. And there's like, something's about to happen. He's about to give you so much money. And he says, I don't have any money. <laughs> Great. This sucks. <laughs> no, he, he, he then says, obviously, he says, I have no silver and gold, 
But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And just astounds this man. This, this reminds me of a time when I was back in high school. I was a leader in our youth group. Uh, and I, I forgot something in my car during youth group. And as I was walking out to the car, I saw this uh, other student uh, sitting on the curb in tears. And I just kind of did the, uh, um, are, you, are you okay? Um, clearly not, just super compassionate. <laughs> uh, and she said, she said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I was like, okay. I tried to keep going, she goes, you have some gum? And I, I said it just like this, I said, I don't have gum, but I have Jesus. And she does the awkward laugh. <laughs> and to this day, like, I, just, I have so much shame over that response. I, I hated myself for months after that response. It just sounded so pretentious and so cocky and so like fake, happy Christian. Um, but then one night, like three months later, this same girl gets up and gives her testimony in front of the whole church and says, on that night, she gave her life to Jesus because she said, I don't have Jesus, and Slim says he does, and I don't want that. And I was just like, is Jesus in the business of creating? Because he can do miracles, clearly. He can take the worst line, the worst evangelistic sermon ever, and bring life out of that. I mean, amen? Amen. Right. Thank you. I mean, he used that lousy line, absolutely he does. So verse 7, it says, He took him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk. I mean, have you ever sat on your foot for a couple hours, and you stand up and it's falling asleep, and you have to do the, you know, the stamp and the, the wiggle? You have, you have a couple of actions to, to get life again. Um, it, it says here, immediately, he comes back and he starts dancing. He's leaping. And this man who was, who was carried daily into the temple had the power of God by the name of Jesus create new muscles as atrophied muscles come back to life and he just starts leaping. And when that happens, the people there instantly thought of what we actually use as our call to worship, uh, Isaiah 35. Then the lame, then shall the lame man leap like deer. But this man was just now created anew, and he starts leaping like a deer. And after leaping, what did he want to do? Verse 8, he enters the temple with them, walking and still leaping, and praising God. And I think this is just the normal response, right? <laughs> the man didn't need to be told, now you must worship God after I heal you. Like, he wasn't told he had to do that. God doesn't have to force you to praise him when, when you see the true God, you, you stand in awe and wonder at Him. I mean, as Josiah talks about the Grand Canyon, it's like going to the Grand Canyon and you see this just great chasm and you, you're, you're not told, all right, now go. You just do. When you go in front of like a giant ocean, you can't even see the, the end of the ocean. You're just going, how is this possible that there is this much water? You're just in awe of it. You're just, you're, you are not told to worship, you worship. It's like this. I, I like to think of myself as a, as a brisket connoisseur. I, I don't know if you like brisket or meat in general. If that's not your thing, you can use coffee if that's your uh, thing. If it's tacos or whatever that might be, um, you may be one of these connoisseurs. But I believe this still holds true no matter what type of sir you are. So what, what, what happens here? Here's how you know if you have the good stuff. So when you sit down and you're eating that brisket, probably from guests, um, and, you get, and you cut it open, and you put it in your mouth, here's how you know if it's good, is that you, you just push back from the table. <laughs> that move right there is the, is the, the tell. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then you have to say, no. <laughs> no, that's stupid. That it just melts in my mouth. That's when you know it's good. When it's candy. <laughs> and if I'm not told I have to go thank the pit boss, I'm not going, you did it right. You did it right. You made this beautiful. 
beautiful. I'm not told I have to do that. I want to do that because it was just so good. And so when we see something so good, we have to praise it. Nothing's making us do it. And so that's how God works. Is he good? Yeah. Say he's good. Tell your neighbor God is good. God is good. Amen. Amen. What? He's that good in creation that we praise him. We love to see him in creation. And yet, many times we praise the creation over the creator. And that's where we have creation and we have fall. In verse 11, and the man was clinging to Peter. You can picture that. He's just been healed by Peter. I'm not going to let go of this guy. I'm not sure how long this miracle will last. And then the crowd comes to Peter, verse 12, and Peter says, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our power or piety we made him walk? Peter's trying to shift the glory away from himself onto the Creator and say, This is, this is not by our power, this is by the power of the name of Jesus. And so note who gets the glory. And I feel like that's something important for us to always remember. Who, who, who am I giving glory to here? Myself or God? Is it the creation or the creator? And so, so how does this man get healed? Because of Jesus. And then Peter goes on to this rant slash sermon and says, oh, you know Jesus. Verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, you know, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You asked for Barabbas to be released from the streets to kill some more. And in verse 15, you killed the author of life. Whom God raised from the dead, to this we are witnesses. And his name by faith, is, his name has made this man strong, who you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And so, how does this miracle happen? Well, Peter then preaches the second sermon and says, Ironically, it's because you took away the author of life. You took life from the author of life. <laughs> The very person who creates life, you took it. You stole it. The one who can give life to these bones and the muscles that you see in this man right here, you took that away from him. And Peter hits the home picture home even harder and says, just to be obvious about this, you actually want to sit on death more than you want to drink from the fountain of life. We do this all the time. We, we want to have a banquet in the grave. And we prefer the fall. I want my sin. I have my pet sin right here that no one's allowed to touch. And we prefer it. We dive into it. But this, this whole account is actually eerily similar to a, a similar passage where Jesus is actually healing in Luke 5. You know, the, 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 the passage of the paralytic, this man who's paralyzed as well, and he can't get to Jesus. Instead of going to the temple, he's trying to see Jesus, and his friends are trying to help him, and they lift him down for a hole in the roof to see Jesus. And before he even asks him of anything uh, and to be healed, Jesus actually gives him forgiveness first before he heals him. And when this happens, you know, he, Jesus says in, in chapter 5, verse 23, My sons, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees freak out. They're like, you've got to be kidding me. This is blasphemy. No one can forgive sins but God. And then Jesus says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And so Jesus does both there. But Jesus is saying right here that the, the number one thing you really need is a relationship with God. As bad as the suffering is, and as committed as God is to ending suffering, your, your primary need is to have an answer for your sin. But he thinks a lot. If I could just have that, then I'd be happy. If I could just have that silver and gold, I'd be happy. Don't trust your heart. Every Disney movie says, follow your heart. Just follow it. And yet, I'm pretty certain that Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Should we follow that? 
Because, you know, the one thing the heart does is always lead you in the right place, right? Everyone say to their neighbor, I don't trust my heart. This man thought, I just need silver and gold. And Peter's walking around with the power to heal him of his, of his legs being atrophied. But even then, even if he said, you know what? Peter has that power. If I could just walk again, then I'd be happy. Give it a month. What's that for you? If I could just have blank, then I'd be happy. Don't trust your heart. There, it's going to take way more to fix your soul than just that thing. And maybe you're looking for silver and gold. Maybe, maybe you're looking for some fix this or fix that. But what we really need is for our sins to be forgiven. If I just had that, then I'd be happy you are lying to yourself. Let me tell you what you really need. The physical is never your deepest need. It's the spiritual. The physical is not unimportant. But the reason the spiritual is, is the deepest need is because it is your deepest hurt. It is what has cast you away from God. It's, it's when the fall happens, we all participated in it. You and I are guilty. We're a part of Team Adam, as Malcolm preached last week. We're on that team wholeheartedly. We love it. But then we also acted in, in, in crucifying Jesus. Look, look at who Peter lays the blame at. Verse 13. I'm going to run through these quick. Sorry. Whom you delivered, verse 14, but you denied, verse 15, and you killed, verse 17, and you acted in ignorance. And he's pushing the blame on them, whether they were there or not. And people want to blame shit and say, well, I may not have intended to do it. He says, whether you were knowledgeable about it or not, you may have acted in ignorance, but you are still at fault for this. You killed him. And you can say, well, I wasn't there. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And the gospel says, absolutely not. The gospel says you're not good, you're broke. And you broke the only thing that was good. And you need a savior. And so our God is committed to justice and to alleviating the pain and brokenness in this world. Yes and amen, but our deepest brokenness is what's going on inside our own hearts. Not your friend's hearts. Not the person you think needs to hear this sermon. Our deepest brokenness is inside our own heart. And until we see that our deepest brokenness is my heart and not theirs, we won't ever change. But let me give you the good news. I'll leave you in the dark spots again. Because you've seen him create, you've seen the fall, and now let's see him recreate. Just as Jesus recreated this man's legs to, to come to life again, he is going to recreate our hearts miraculously. Some of you may say, yeah, but miracles, I don't really believe in that stuff. I believe in the natural order. It's just not possible. I'm a person that believes in only the natural miracles or just the suspension of the natural order. No. Let me tell you this, that biblical miracles are a restoration of the natural order. i say that again. That biblical miracles are a restoration of the natural order. Someone say restoration. Restoration. All right, it's what's bringing back what ought to be. It's the only natural thing there is, right? It, what is natural? Not to suffer. Not to die. Not to go blind. Not to be lame. That's not the way that our Creator has created. He, when, he, when He was creating this canvas, He wanted it to be beautiful. And so God's miracles are a way of restoring the, the world back to its natural order, the way that it should be. And when Jesus walked around on earth, you notice he didn't just do miracles to just gain attention and applause. He wasn't flying around, as some people might think. He wasn't saying, watch this, I'm going to shoot laser beams from my eyes. No, that, that's DC stuff right there. That, that's comic book stuff. If Jesus' miracles and the apostles' miracles are, are miracles of recreation, of restoring the world back to the way it should be. And so have, have you guys ever gone through old family photos? Um, we, we, we're going through some of that right now, going through family photos. But if you've ever gone through some really old family photos, maybe your grandparents and your parents, it can be a startling thing, right? You look at many pictures of them when they were younger, and you go, oh, they were good looking. <laughs> or you're like, no way. They were in track. <laughs> what? What? They, they served in the military? Are you kidding? And you look at these 
pictures, and, and what we see now, maybe a person in a wheelchair who doesn't remember much. And we look at those pictures and we think, what happened? But the beautiful thing about this passage and about the miracles is that it shows us that God is in the business of recreating his creation to its original state. And so in heaven, we're going to have bodies that are even better than we were when we were teenagers. And so my grandmother and my grandfather, who, who no longer are alive today, they will no longer be that person, one, in the ground. They will no longer be the person who forgot everything. They will no longer be the person who, is, who became weak and weak and weak. They will no longer be that because their bodies are going to be changed in the blink of an eye. Just like that. And they're going to run track. And they're going to be bodybuilders. They have bowling balls for biceps. Isn't that good news? So remember what we said. That our deepest need is not physical, it's spiritual. And so their deepest need isn't even for a new body. Their deepest need is for their name to be written in the book of life. And so you can be awed by the miracles of God and not God himself. You can, you can and we usually do, want the things of God and not God himself. And so this happens a lot. And, 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 and the scripture here is saying, if you don't listen to the prophet that Moses was talking about,